So the idea of plague is very scary, and people remember the Middle Ages when a third of the population might have died, and the Pied Piper, and rats, and is it really that bad? Well, I mean, it was that bad. Was it? Yeah. Um, so it killed 30 to 50 percent of the European population in, oh. in five years, which is a very short period of time. It changed social systems. It changed religions. It's had a profound effect. And speaking of a short period of time, it didn't take weeks to kill them either. No. It, it, most people die untreated, which there would have been no treatment at the time, um, in three days or less. Whoa. Yeah, it's very, very So that would lead you to want to run out of town and hide yourself in the woods or something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Which is, I think, what people did sometimes. In some cases, yeah, or they would bar off cities or it's all kinds of techniques that people try. Right. But your particular interest is how this spread across the world and how plague might actually have been a selection force that changed the human genome. Yes, this is something that people talk about a lot, but it hasn't actually been functionally tested very well. Uh, yeah, so there's been multiple plagues, right? So plague emerged about 2,600 years ago. Uh, we believe, based on descriptions of symptoms, that we had a Central African sort of Near Eastern plague called the Justinian Plague between uh, 541 to 544 AD. But with the 14th century outbreak that starts in 1345, we see a whole other level of virulence. Um, and this plague, which we have uh, some genetic information for now, seems to be the predecessor for all subsequent plagues. So has, was it genetically different and that why it's got my na more nasty or what? Yeah, so we think that that's the case. We know that it's genetically, um, that it's genetically different from perhaps things that, well, as soon as we know, we, it's genetically different, we believe, from things that preceded it. And there's uh, sequences now that indicate that it it's, uh, has relatively new changes to its genome at that time. Uh, so that might be the reason why it was able to lose So what good would it do, plague, to kill everybody? Why not just kill a few people so it can stick around? I don't think pathogens, well, pathogens don't think. Don't but, think <laughs> but all that really matters to a pathogen, right, is that it's able to reproduce. This is something Spread that reproduces itself. very, very quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not like plague is, you know, it's not like plague has a motive, it's not trying to kill you. It's just to get what it needs. And to do but, what it but, wants. A, but a cold virus is not nearly so bad. No. I mean, how come some things are much more nasty and some things are much less nasty? I think it has a lot to do with resource requirements and how they get there, mm -hmm. right? So in the case of plague, um, it, it's replicating like crazy because it run it ends up in a lymph node where it's able to do that, and then when it spreads, it starts acquiring a great deal of iron, um, which allows it to make films. That makes it very difficult to. Uh, kill. So you can't attack it. And yeah, so you can't attack it very easily and, you know, so it's able to cloak itself and then, but at the same time it's triggering off all kinds of inflammatory responses that kill you. So some people have suggested that some genes have been affected by plague coming through a population. Yeah, so there's a few things that we think might have been affected. Uh, so there's been suggestions that uh, a very important complex for identifying early invaders known as the toll-like receptor 1610 complex, that that string of genes on chromosome 4 might have been selected for. Or so very, pe people with some variations for. didn't die as likely of playing. Right, exactly. So there's some variants that might exist in the population because of, of that. Uh, but the most famous would be uh, variations on a chemokine receptor. So this is a receptor that's engaged in cell trafficking called CCR5. So that sounds like the one where if you have two copies of the Delta 32, you don't get HIV. Uh -huh, that's or right. You, or if you get it, it doesn't progress. Well, so the way that HIV works, right, is that on early infection, in humans anyway, HIV almost always needs to use this co-receptor CCR5. Um, it might go on to use other receptors later to in infect cells, but even if it's using another receptor predominantly in a person, when they infect somebody else, it resets itself to use CCR5. It likes to use CCR5. Interesting. Yeah. So it sounds like it'd be a great thing to have two copies that don't have that bit of CCR5 so that the HIV can't get into your cells. Right, yeah, and there's a guy in Germany who's living proof that um, in at least this one case, uh, where he was HIV positive and also had leukemia, he had a, a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was had two copies of CCR5 Delta 32, and he's been HIV free for 
10 plus years. Without any drugs, probably. Without any drugs. Now, that hasn't been the case for a handful of other people who've had this same procedure. Is that right? Yeah. But that has been the case for this man. And what's interesting is that, I mean, this is not, this is a proof of concept sort of ex experiment, uh -huh. right? It's not something that's practical because he has to be on immunosuppressive drugs also now for the rest of his mm -hmm. life, right? So, and it's So I'm guessing, difficult. though, that the reason the most of the rest of us, it's like 90% of us at least, even in Europe, have no regular copies of CCR5, um, it must be there are disadvantages also to losing that little bit of CCR5. There might be. We don't really know because chemokines and chemokine receptors are very, very redundant. So let's see, a lot of your early work is on sepsis, which is an overwhelming infection that kills lots and lots of people. How many people die from sepsis these days? Well, so 750,000 people in the U.S. are affected every year. Gram-negative bacterial sepsis. So what, sepsis. Is it? what is sepsis really? So sepsis is an overt immune response so to a trigger. It's more the immune response than yeah. it is the infection itself. Yeah, and it can be triggered by lots of different things. Um, but the one that's most fatal, or the version that tends to be most fatal here, is uh, sepsis is triggered by gram-negative bacteria. And there's a special substance on their coats. Yeah, so gram-negative bacteria have a lot of lipopolysaccharide around the outside. Lipopolysaccharide, LPS. LPS, yeah. Inject it in somebody and what happens? So if you give them a dose between three to five nanograms per kilogram of weight. Which is not much. Which is not very much at all. Uh, they'll get a fever, they'll feel really nasty, they might progress to some symptoms. If you give them 10 nanograms, you'll kill them. That's uh, it. So, that's so it. does the... Is that like a toxin, or does the toxin set off something in our bodies? So what happens, we think, is that the LPS triggers off uh, overt immune signaling. So our cells, various immune cells that would see this at the beginning of, a, of a, an infection or even just the LPS all by itself, um, send off a, see it and send off a strong, strong pro-inflammatory signal. And what they're doing is that they're trying not just to kill whatever has the LPS, but they're trying to signal to other immune cells to come to the location and fix the problem. So come, come for reinforcements and it's an overshoot. Yeah, exactly. And so after that, so it's you can't just release pro-inflammatory cytokines in a system and nothing else happens after that. Mm -hmm. They trigger the response of other cytokines. And all of these proteins are, um, they're highly reactive. And so they, you know, they kill a lot of tissue in the process. Making other places where things can grow better sometimes. Well, sometimes. In the case of sepsis, one of the things that it does is that it, uh, is that a lot of these cytokines start to trigger like the loosening of cell junctions. So in arteries, which can lead to then. They can spread faster. Well, or so, so liquid leaks out. all beta uh, all gram-negative bacteria have LPS on their surface? Yes. and so our, so our guts are full of Tons, bacteria yeah. that have lots of LPS, yeah. but it's not usually killing us. No, but the main receptors we know that see LPS are expressed differently in the gut epithelial tissue facing those bacteria than they are elsewhere in the body. So what's important to sepsis uh, might be that LPS ends up in a spot where a lot of things can see it. Like the blood vessels? Like the blood vessels, yeah. So if you inject a bunch of E. coli bacteria, which probably wouldn't hurt you much in your gut, um, if they're circulating in your arteries, yeah, it might be a whole different story. You don't need very much to trigger a big problem. And the thing is, is that among, like in the mammalian kingdom, not a lot of other, in the mammalian class, sorry, um, nobody else seems to respond this strongly. So humans are special and so different. So humans are pretty special. We see sometimes in neonate cows, you know, calves are susceptible. Uh, but that's so interesting. But that's so it. humans get sepsis way more easily than other primates? Way more easily than other primates. And we do see, like, examples, rabbits are susceptible. There's a few, but they're just... So what, what might they, account for that big difference? Phylogenetically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So Is it just humans, or are there other primates that are especially sensitive also? Well, we don't really know about the other apes, and it wouldn't be ethical to continue to test it. So we right. don't really know. But, uh, but all the other primates that we do test, uh, that we have done these tests on, require 10 to 100 times the dose of LPS. Whoa. Yeah, like a lot. Like biologically improbable levels of bacteria. So I'm going to ask you to speculate for a minute, Jessica. What could possibly account for this? Might be just chance, I suppose. But what kind of selection forces might make us so much more reactive to LPS? It could be very, very complicated. So it could be that we've had a pathogen that's swept through humans that makes us more susceptible for one reason or another. It could be microbial communities that we have on us that make us more susceptible. But the thing is, is that the immune system is very promiscuous. And it could very well be that 
you know, our immune system has evolved in ways that might have not a lot to do with pathogens that somehow makes us additionally susceptible. So we also live a lot longer, so it's probably more worthwhile to invest more in protecting against death from infection. True, but the people who die of gram-negative bacteria sepsis include neonates and people over the age of 50. Everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody's susceptible. But yeah, little so guys. Are we making any progress in treating sepsis thanks to these ideas? Well, I hope <laughs> someday. Uh, and if, it, if it's the immune system that's knocking us off, then presumably blocking that arm of the immune system should help. So my understanding is that the main clinical approach to uh, someone who presents with sepsis, because time is limited, people die in three to five days, and they progress very quickly. So my my understanding is that the way that it's main, like mainly approached is if you show up with signs of sepsis and it's identified, uh, you get a big load of antibiotics. Let's just kill whatever's causing it. Okay. And that's that's the primary approach. There have been attempts to try to control it with other cytokines. Mm -hmm. So give somebody a shot of a particular cytokine and hopefully that kills the problem. But mm -hmm. you know, then you're dealing with a big surge of a response coming back and it and can be difficult to control. And how about steroids to downregulate inflammation? I mean, that's also a, a treatment option as well. But yeah. Okay.